Do you ever just take a moment to enjoy the beautiful sky and all of the surrounding views around you? Take a deep, fresh breath there and try to just de-stress from a long day's work just to relax. Many of us have full days. We get up bright and early every morning. Work all the way through the day to come home and have more chores and make dinner. The only time that we could actually find a little bit of peace and quiet is in the late nighttime hours. Sit out on the back porch, just gazing off into the nighttime sky, watching the falling stars. Just enjoying the clouds as they move through the darkness of night with the spotlight of the moon hitting just right off of those clouds. Makes kind of things seem better. A hard day smooths out just a tail bit so that we can venture home and maybe catch a few hours of sleep before we got to do it all again. Before we got to jump back into that stressful moment of life, we enjoy just a couple hours of stress-free life. You think Brian Cobra is any different than any of us that got to do that? Brian Cobert, or PhD student, teacher's aide. Not only did he have to study hard, but he was working his way through it, helping others get their education. Other people's kids were being helped by Brian Koberger to further their education to be successful in life. Yet at the end of the day, when we focus in, we want to pick apart an alibi that may just be more honest than many other criminals out there that sit and think and ponder and try to manufacture a way to make it seem as though they weren't where they were or they didn't do what they did. He just took the simplicity of it and said, hey, look, I was out trying to defuse. I like to look at the sky. My phone will dictate pictures. I'm sitting here on death row awaiting in my future right here in this jail cell found guilty by 98% of the country that watch mainstream media. They listen to everything the victim's family wants to put out, but they haven't heard one word, not one word of what my voice and my alibi just might be. But they also haven't heard the words that are being expressed by the defense team that's actually taken charge within the Idaho 4 case. Let's discuss this just a little bit because I think it's rather important that the only team Within the Idaho Ford that showed a little bit of strength and also a little bit of evidence to go within the case is the defense. I'm A.R. Hayes. The sick convict stops. And I hate to say it, but doesn't it seem as though the prosecution kind of is cuffed in their own madness? Now remember, The prosecution is not the actual investigative team that goes out to gather the evidence utilized in a case. But they are the ones that have to go over all said evidence to decide whether charges should be filed and how they actually want to prosecute the said case. Since the PCA of the Idaho 4 case was released in regards to Brian Koberger's arrest with the details within it, 
of the cell phone pings. The eyewitness so-called statement of Dylan Mortensen, the route of the car being driven. What other strength or evidence has been ever even pondered by the facts of the actual case by the prosecution or the investigation. We've seen the search warrants. We've seen the evidence seized from the crime scenes. I call them crime scenes, but they're really not where the crime was committed. We're talking about Brian Kohlberger's apartment. We're talking about his parents' house. We're talking about the search of his car. We're talking about these various things. And that's all the information that's ever been actually released in regards to the prosecution's case. So the strength actually now is transitioned off of the prosecution's evidence to the defense. Because if you think about it, after the initial evidence was released via the prosecution's PCA. All we ever heard was mainstream media's manufactured evidence. Like the Amazon knife order with no actual receipt or confirmation. The victim's IDs found in a glove within a box in the back of Brian Koberger's closet. Never actually confirmed evidence. The stalking of the victims by Brian Koberger, the hunter, the man that was just all passionate about these girls, possibly Maddie, maybe Kaylee, who knows who it was. All gossip, manufactured. No proven evidence to it, and now that's even been degraded evidence considering Bill Thompson in a very courtroom over the survey deemed it non-factual, not evidence, not true. And now everybody's wanting to put a spin on that to just say it's only one victim he was talking about it not being true about. Or, come on, ladies and gentlemen, he deemed there was no stalker in the Idaho 4 case. All right, we got to stop with all this. Mainstream media continues to put the spin as if it's the only source of evidence for the prosecution. And yes, I understand. There's a gag order. I fully get it. But guess what? There's also the BS order that's coming out of mainstream media that's feeding the guilters' minds. And every time something comes from the defense that is actually valuable, it shows some strength on the Koberger defense side. They discredit it. They don't listen to it. They don't hear it. Which is crazy to me. So if you think about it, people are willing to put more listening skills and weight into Non-factual, non-confirmed evidence, not given by any expert or anybody involved within the case whatsoever, compared to a defensive statement regards the alibi that they have an expert. And I'm not saying just a random nobody. Talk about an actual expert. This man has credentials that are worthy that the prosecution in numerous cases have relied on this man to convict said defendants. But for some reason, because he's sitting now on a defendant side of thing, actually living the correct way as an expert of doing things, you follow the truth. You follow the evidence. You don't follow the narrative. If the truth is to be let loose 
by experts, it needs to be let loose, whether before or against a defendant. So if this man, for the very first time, as an expert, is willing to sit behind his work on the defensive side of things to protect Brian Coburn, and defend him, and fight for his rights because he deems as though the evidence shows Brian Koberger was not specifically where somebody else has claimed without any confirmed evidence he was. And that expert is a stand-up individual and deserves the credibility he has earned through his hard work. Those picking him apart are not realizing that you, you've really got to take thought to this. And I'm very thankful because I actually had a subscriber on my very channel leave a comment that drove this point home. And I am thankful and I give them a shout out. And I'm so glad that people are critically thinking and seeing outside the box. That's all I ask for. I haven't said, deem this man is guilty or innocent. All I've said is, think outside the box. Think for yourself. Listen and weigh out the factors before decision is ever made on guilt or innocence. But think about this, ladies and gentlemen. If the prosecution wants to deem this individual, this defense expert, as incapable within the field that he states he is an expert within. Go back to all the cases prior that this man has worked on, testified in, and helped prosecutions get their guilty verdicts and wipe it all out. If you're not credible in this case, in the Brian Koberger Idaho 4 case, you're not creditable. I mean, I hate to say that, but it's the truth. So now you've got to wonder if the prosecution really wants to put this man's expertise to the test and question his capabilities that have built the long resume that he has, do we need to go back and look at each and every single case that he sat on the prosecution's side as an expert and testified in? Do we have to rip all those back as questionable and tarnished? Why? Because right now, he's sitting on the side of a man that he feels as though is innocent. He hasn't made that statement clearly out of his mouth that he feels innocent. But I'll state, by the motion that was filed, if he's going to come and testify for the defense of Brian Koberger, in the very manner that Ann Taylor documented in the last alibi motion to the court I think he's going to say he's innocent I think he's going to make the very strong statement he disagrees with the investigations and results putting Brian Koberger in Moscow, Idaho at the quadruple homicide crime scene People can spin it all you want. Now, if you came back at me and you said, well, this gentleman's only going to clearly state for this time frame he wasn't possibly at that crime scene. Okay, now do we need to go back and look at law enforcement like I've been screaming with the way that they just seem to have fallen a little short in their investigation? And that's probably due to a, lack of experience. B, lack of resources. And C, probably just short-staffed 
I mean, I hate to say it, across the board throughout the United States, I believe at this point in time, law enforcement is at a heavy disadvantage when it comes to investigations just due to the fact they don't have the numbers, they don't have the experience, because the long-term investigators are retiring and being replaced by people with less than a handful of years leading the investigations. Look at Idaho 4. Two years. We're paying. Two years. How much experience does he have? How much experience does he have working within Moscow, Idaho? If you told me he was from Chicago or New York City or Dallas, Texas or Phoenix, Arizona or Los Angeles and he had been on the beat for a while, well, then I would give you some grain of salt that he probably has some experience. Not from his background. He just doesn't. It doesn't mean he's not a good person. It doesn't mean that he doesn't mean well. It just means he most likely doesn't know fully what these investigations entail. And I think it shows. Every step of the way, I feel as though the investigation is what's actually frustrating good old Bill Thompson to the point he's blowing up in court because he feels the power. The tide of power within this case is shifting to the defense. And it has been since the PCA was utilized as the strength for the prosecution. Think about what the defense has put out in power of Brian Coburn's defense. No connection to the victims. No connection with the victims found in the so-called vehicle used during the crime. Nothing found at the apartment. Nothing found at his office. Oh, yippity yay, they found some old stuff at his parents' house. But remember, ladies and gentlemen, he had been in Moscow, Idaho for four or five months. And what does the stuff at his parents' house possibly have to do with the actual crime? You think he brought the evidence back with him from Moscow, Idaho to his parents' house? I doubt it. Especially after being pulled over twice in a couple of minutes span. I know he was being followed all the way back. There's no doubt about it. But he personally himself would have found a way to dump. If he had any evidence in his car, he would have got rid of it. They wouldn't have found it in his parents' house. And all this stuff, he was found in his boxers with a pair of gloves on, bagging leafy substance up in the freaking kitchen and dumping it in the... This is all fluff and duff, ladies and gentlemen. You're getting fed unconfirmed information. And until it's actually confirmed or boldly stated by the prosecution, how can you say it's real? What has the prosecution, as for evidence, been showcased powerfully within the court's filings or motion, like the defense has? You know, and for those who say, well, it's all about the gag order, that's why they can't do it. Ladies and gentlemen, look at the defense. Have they gotten in trouble for what they're doing? They're clearly making bold statements. And what has the prosecution done? They backpedaled. Backpedaled. The IGG is still up for grabs. I mean, it's still a mess. People say that's all said, done. It's not. There's been more fighting over that IGG information. Still going. Come on. What, what have they put out? There's no cash report even back. That was stated. That was boldly stated by the prosecution in the very court. They don't have that back. They have some documented notes in regards to it. They have a draft. They don't have anything more. 
And I know it may come. But when it does come, is Bill Thompson going to look at that and say, oh, man, this doesn't line up with what I was expecting it to? So the defense's version with their expert kind of makes sense now. Nobody saw a still picture of the white Hyundai Elantra put out for the bolo for everybody to be looking for. I, I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, from my past experiences and all the people that I've been around locked up in the penitentiary, and I was on yards so of 2,500 to 3,000 people for years upon years looking at paperwork, looking at discoveries, looking at everything that these people had because I wanted to learn. That's what I was. I was... I was engaged in that stuff. I love to read the reports, the discoveries, what nailed them, what, what didn't. I mean, we also had to read the paperwork to make sure that we didn't have certain types of people on the very yard we were on. And I'm telling you, there was always a lot more credible information than what we've seen so far in the Idaho 4. I get it. It seems like the whole case is going to come down to <laughs> that DNA on the sheath. If if it even makes it to the trial. Because right now, I think even the prosecution is sitting in the background just trying to weasel it out. We're in discovery request number 15. 15 by a defense. Do you know what they're looking for? Do you know why they keep doing this? Why they're requesting all this information? Did everybody hear it? Paying attention, right? We got it all from the last motion. They feel as though there is exculpatory evidence, and they don't know whether Bill Thompson, the prosecution's hiding it, or if they discarded it. Kind of like that black jacket. Remember that black jacket that was just hanging on the fire hydrant that looked like the one Maddie wore, the one they picked up and just threw to the side. That's called discarding of evidence. You remember that big trash pile that had that pizza box, which a lot of people don't think is very important, but would you like to prove that Xana and Ethan ordered pizza at midnight on the night of the actual crime to kind of gauge whether or not they would have ordered DoorDash to eat again just a few hours later? That pizza box would have been important and it was never even looked at. Never even thought of. What about that white Hyundai Elantra that just perfectly fit into the years that they put the Molo out that they were looking for? Same color, same car. Miraculously, if it comes back, to a car that was tied to the very crime scene home's owner? <laughs> what a coincidence. But we don't need to look into that. That's not important. What's important is we have this knife sheath with a little bit of touch DNA that we're not going to really outright admit it, but we found a roundabout way to figure out whose touch DNA was on that, and we're running with it. And now we're piecing everything together, even changing our timeline to fit things a little bit better so that when we go to court, there should actually already be reasonable doubt because who could actually say when the crime happened for sure. But I'm telling you, I know from experience, they would have released a still photo of the very car they were seeking for the occupant or occupants. And if they had a clear picture directly face on from 1112 King Road, the one with a still photo and the perfect look straightforward came out, if the car had drove right there, you could clearly see the white Hyundai Elantra with Brian Koberger in it, as a single individual within the car, it would have been released to the public. Guaranteed. 
They would have floated that out before any gag order had a chance to even be put into place because that would have been the nail in the coffin. And I get it. I understand. People say, well, they would never release that because they wouldn't want Brian Koberger to run or put anybody. They let him run. They allowed others to be put into danger. What the hell would the difference have been? Ladies and gentlemen, right now, I don't care what Ashley Banfield says in the fact that if her daughter was out and driving at night, and we would have to talk about it. I mean, the whole thing that she blows up out of her mouth and then Nancy Grace, the supposed of has all this experience, defense counsel, and around the law, and she makes herself look that foolish through the words that come out of her mouth, that people like myself that have been through the very system that know what she's saying is complete garbage. We can't even watch it because it's garbage. It's like just Judge Judy on Fox. You might as well just tune in to normal everyday cartoons and that's what you would be getting by listening to them talk about this case. Bill Thompson's mad because he realized the power is slipping directly out of his hands day by day into the defense and the defense is just playing it cool. They're not in a rush. They're not having to put all of their ammo out there just steadily picking apart the prosecution's case. And that's what you do. Now, don't get me wrong. When this goes to trial, we're going to hear experts for the prosecution. They're going to have to put on some bombshell experts that are going to have to make so much sense that 12 people sitting in that jury box are willing to only think what they have to say is credible, not what the defense's experts have. And trust me, the defense does have other experts. We've only heard of this one so far. There's going to be more. There's going to be experts on the car. There's going to be experts on what was transitioning in his very life. his schooling, his education. There's going to be a lot of experts. A lot of people stepping up to the plate that are going to actually discuss the very manner that the crime happened. The wounds, the blood splatters. There's going to be so much. So many experts. And it seems like Ann Taylor... She's getting stronger by the day, so it's going to be interesting to see. But I just want everybody to take a deep breath. Every once in a while, go outside, go for a walk, take a night drive, enjoy the stars, take in some fresh air, and realize everything's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. All you got to do Continue to enjoy each and every second that you have with your loved ones, your friends, your animals, those around you. We can make it through anything, even the toughest of times. May our haze. Another night. I appreciate all your love. We'll be talking again very soon. Convict's thoughts.